We're going back to fluids, my favourite. Uh, we're going to talk about the drag equation. This tells us the friction or the air resistance, i.e. the drag, acting on an object which is moving through a fluid. Let's say our sphere is moving that way. Then as it does, as it moves through the air, the air pushes back and it's going to create this frictional air resistance drag force and we actually have an equation for what that is. The air being fluid, by the way. You keep saying <laughs> fluid, but air is a fluid. Air is a fluid, right. Fluids are things that change shape to fit the container that they are inside. So all gases, all liquids, even some things that you might think are solids blend over into fluid. Yeah. So yes, here we're thinking air is definitely a fluid for the purposes of, of fluid dynamics in this particular equation. So the equation says that the drag force is equal to one half times rho, where this is the fluid density, multiplied by my velocity squared, multiplied by the drag coefficient, CD. So this will depend on your object the shape of your object, what it's made from, lots of things are going to affect this. Finally, A, which we call the 2D projected area. So you can think of this as the bit of your object that's kind of like hitting that wall of air. The leading face. The leading face, yes. So if you were, I'm going to test my artistic talents. So if you're like a car, you've really got like the bonnet and then kind of it kind of angles up and this would be like your windscreen and then like the roof. So for, and then you'd have your tires sticking out. So this is a car coming towards you. This area here is the frontal area because this is what the air hits as the car is coming towards you. So imagine like in all of these situations, the frontal area is as the object is moving towards you, what do you see? And this is it. We just need to know these values and this will give us the drag force for a particular object. Also, it is important to say that this will vary depending on the Reynolds number, which is something I've talked about before. Uh, and what we tend to assume here is that the flow is turbulent. So that means you're working here with a Reynolds number of about 10 to the 4. That is true for dropping a ball off a building. That is true for a car driving. It's turbulent flow. That's when this equation is true. If you have laminar flow, which is a bit more relaxed, chill, you're going much more slowly, then it's a different equation. You get what's called a linear drag equation. But we're talking about turbulent flow, quadratic drag this form. So if I have my sphere and I've got the air coming at it like this, then this has a CD value of 0.47. If we then compare that to say a cube, this has a drag coefficient of 1.05. And then something else that perhaps some of you picked up on is the orientation here is going to be important. So if we change the cube and had it same size, put it on its side like this, and then you have the air coming in. It makes it more aerodynamic. The air is going to hit and kind of pass around that shape. So here, the drag coefficient goes down. There's less drag because it's a more streamlined shape. Tom, does the material the object is made of make a difference to its drag coefficient? Yes, it, it will in some context. I think if you've got a sphere that's, let's say, made from metal versus made from um, lead, it's not really going to have a big effect. Oh, it's still lead, like lead is a metal. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely having no, having no effect. Okay, if you've got like a steel sphere versus let's say a concrete sphere, it's still smooth enough that the change would hardly have an effect. But if you had a steel sphere versus, I don't know, a sphere made of like candy floss, that's going to have an effect because there are actually, there are like holes in the candy floss. Or if it's like made of like a mesh, there are holes and that's what's going to have an effect. Or even, it's more the, the, the smoothness of the surface. So like a golf ball, is a sphere but has a lower drag coefficient because it has the dimples to make it more aerodynamic. So with the angled cube, just to sort of complete this, it actually drops from 1.05 to 0.8. And then the most streamlined thing, it's literally called a streamlined body or an aerofoil. This has a drag coefficient of 0.04. These things, this shape kind of comes out of the, the actual computation and calculation of how do we make this as small as possible. So the, the air kind of comes in, it sort of separates here and goes around like so. And then this tail kind of causes it to come back together at the end. Rather than it breaking off and creating all of this turbulence behind it, that adds to the drag. So the fact that it can sort of stick and come back together at the end makes it really nice and streamlined. So what we're going to do is we're going to take some well-known objects and we're going to pretend that we are dropping them uh, through the air or maybe uh, in the ocean. So race one, uh, we are doing falling objects uh, through the air. This is a drag race. It's a drag race. 
<laughs> okay, it's a drag race. Yeah, we're doing a drag race. Um, <laughs> imagine taking a human being and let's say a bowling ball. And we're going to drop both of these out of a plane. Something like a normal skydive jump. Let's go with that. So we're going to drop both of these objects out of the plane. And then the drag equation will tell you who will win the drag race. Like which object will hit the ground first between the human and the bowling ball if dropped from a plane. So we need to figure out these uh, parameters. But before we do that, we also need to think about what other forces are actually present in this situation. So we've talked about drag. So if this is my bowling ball, which is falling, as this is coming down the page towards the ground, the drag force is acting in that direction. It's pushing it up. The reason it's falling in the first place is from gravity. It's pulling it, gravitational acceleration. So the force there is mass times gravitational acceleration. So you've got a force balance and this will be the same for the human. And so what's going to happen is when you drop your object, you're initially at zero. So we're going to start, start from rest. That is important. So we're starting from rest. So we're jumping out of a plane or dropping out of a plane. So we're starting at zero velocity. So at the beginning, you're going to accelerate. Gravity is pulling you to the earth. You're going to speed up. As you speed up, velocity goes up. Drag looks like velocity squared. So as V goes up, drag goes up. You're going to speed up more and more from gravity and you're going to have more and more drag pushing against you. And eventually they're going to be perfectly balanced. You will not stop. <laughs> you will reach a constant speed. You won't just float in the air. You, it would be great, <laughs> wouldn't it? <laughs> so you accelerate most at the beginning and your acceleration slows down, but your speed is continually increasing until it reaches a flat point. And that's called your terminal velocity. Whichever one has the fastest terminal velocity will win. Unless you dropped from really, really low. Unless you dropped from really low. Yeah, no, you make a good point. Your, your velocity in general looks something like this. This is time and this is going to be V for velocity. And then you can see here, so this would be your terminal velocity, your maximum VT. So what you see is you, you increase faster and faster and then you slow down, 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 and then you never get. So this is the shape that you get and you can solve the equations and get this exact shape. So we actually know that these, the time it takes to reach your terminal velocity on a skydive because lots of people do it. So after three seconds, you're about 50% of the way there. After eight seconds, you're about 90% of the way. And after 15 seconds, you're about 99%. It's tending towards this as time goes to infinity. So you're probably never going to exactly reach the terminal velocity, but you're going to get so close that we can say you are. We're assuming here we're reaching it and that's going to be our speed and that's going to determine who wins the race. So to actually get the equation then, we've got to solve drag force equals gravity. So we want to know when these are equal. We know the formula for drag force. So we just say that's a half uh, rho v squared cd a equals mg. And this is what we're interested in, right? The velocity is what we care about. So you rearrange this and we're going to get V equals uh, 2 mg. Then I've got to divide by the rho, the drag coefficient, the area, and then I've got a square root. And we take the positive square root because, well, we're falling down, but <laughs> we have a, we're taking the positive value of the velocity. So this is going to be our terminal velocity here. So in order to figure this out for our human and for our bowling ball, we need to know these values. And we just plug them in, and whichever one has the highest terminal velocity is going to win our race. What's your what's your money on? Human versus bowling ball. I think the bowling ball is going to hit the ground first. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll see. It's kind of like it's obviously the human's heavier, hmm. but yeah, there's something else going on. I think you know. more area. It feels yeah. like more area. <laughs> and, well, that's the, the and not by, and not quite dense enough for its mass to overtake. But yeah, we'll see. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I'm not totally confident. Okay, all right. So, so we're going for. We, th we think it might be the bowling ball. How's the human folding? Yeah, like star jumping. Let's say, kind of. Sort of pancaking. They're yeah, not. They're yeah, not yeah, going yeah. head first. They're not going head first. Yeah, you know that that is important. So you're almost giving your maximum amount of area you could. Yes, yes, yes. You're not like going head first and yeah. trying to go really fast. Yeah, <laughs> which would be terrifying. We need to just know all of these values now. Two doesn't change. Gravity, so I'll write that over here because that's not going to change. That's 9.81 meters per second squared. Gravitational acceleration on Earth. The mass, m, that matters. So 
am. A human, um, 100 kg ish. That's heavy, but That's yeah, heavy. but it's a round. It's number. a nice number, yeah. <laughs> we like nice numbers. We're going 100 kg. Uh, a bowling ball, I think around like 5 kg. They're about eight and a half pounds, I think. So, 5 kg. Then we've got the air density. So, that doesn't change because we're falling through air. It's a bit of an approximation. We're going to just take it to be constant. Right, so 1.225 kilograms per meter cubed is sort of average air density, I think at 15 degrees at like sea level. So obviously when you're a bit higher up, it's a bit thinner. It's the same for both of them as well. So it doesn't really matter too much, does it? Now the interesting ones, we've got the drag coefficient and then we've got the area. So the bowling ball, it's a sphere. We already said what the drag coefficient of a sphere was. It's 0.47. So even though it has a couple of holes for your hands, they're not gonna have that big of an effect. So it's about 0.47. And it is nice and smooth as well. So that's maybe, maybe the super smooth, it's really well polished. Maybe that overcomes the little holes for your fingers. <laughs> Uh, now for a human, so this value, this will depend on the human, right? Because you can have somebody who's, who's really, really skinny is possibly going to be more aerodynamic than someone who is more round. Doesn't the say. area take care of that though? Yes, but it's also going to have an effect on the, on the drag coefficient as well. Right. So the area, yeah, the area is obviously going to... And you could be hairy and not hairy. Exactly, you know? very good, yeah. Hairy and not hairy, etc. So, so this is about between 1 and 1.3. So you can, you know, various experiments have been done on humans. It's somewhere between one and 1.3. Now the area, so bowling ball, it's a sphere. As it's coming towards you, it's 2D projected area will be a circle. You're seeing a circle. It's quite potentially hard to visualize, but it would be a circle. It's like the projection of the sphere into 2D. It's going to be a circle. So it's not that hard to visualize. You've drawn one yeah. there. <laughs> 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 right, so uh, so the area then is just going to be pi times the radius squared. I think the radius for a bowling ball is about, radius I think is 11 centimetres for a standard. So the area is going to be 0 0.036 metres squared. So it's quite a small area. The area for a human, this is going to vary quite a bit depending on the size of your human. Um, I did some rough calculations and said, well, using nice numbers, about two meters tall, about like half a meter wide, it's kind of like one <laughs> meter squared, about, ranging from less as well. That's a big so, human, but yeah. It's a big human, so I think I, think I went for like 0 0.5 to one meter squared, I think here. That was, you know, there's, there's enough of a range in there. I, th I think I actually used one in the calculation, so it's a reasonably big human. Feel free to obviously input your own numbers, maybe measure yourself and find out what your frontal area is and plug it into the void and see how fast you would be. So now we've actually got everything and we can get the terminal velocity. So this is a big moment. Whichever one of these is bigger, is going to win our race. So the human, you get around 37 meters per second, which is pretty fast. <laughs> that is really fast. You're moving 37 meters every second when you fall at terminal velocity through the air. Now the bowling ball. So this is what your money was on, wasn't it? So the bowling ball, the velocity here is about 69 meters per second. Boom. Boom. I know. All right. So it's, a, it's, a, it's actually wins by quite a long way. You had the right idea when we were chatting about this, right? The, the bowling ball is a lot smaller, so it has a much lower mass. So its velocity is less because M is going down. These two on the bottom are much uh, smaller as well. The drag in the area are so much smaller for the bowling ball compared to the human, it really wins out. So it would be almost twice as fast. I think if we did uh, an average skydive somewhere between 10 and 14,000 feet, I think I did 12,000 to get a nice average number. Um, you can calculate this. So time to fall, I think I did 4,000 meters. 13,000 feet or so. For the human, this would take about 108 seconds, whereas the bowling ball would take 58 seconds. So just under a minute, the bowling ball to hit the ground, whereas the human, you're going like one minute 40, one minute 50. So bowling ball wins by quite a long way, actually. Have you ever been skydiving? I haven't. No. I'd be up for it. You seem like someone who would have done it. <laughs> I've done a bungee jump, and this kind of put me off. I always wanted to do a bungee jump, and then the I was I got to the top, and the guy was like, right, you're gonna go. I was like, okay, fine, straight away. And that that moment, I don't think I could describe, it just felt so wrong. I'm facing the ground, you don't feel like you're attached. And so it kind of scared me that if I jumped out of a plane, I'd have the exact same, like... Ugh. I think a plane's so much higher though, it doesn't seem real. That's the other thing, because mm. yeah, because with the bungee you can see the ground, mm. the plane you're just kind of like, I'm floating, this mm. is great, and then... Anyway, I haven't done either. <laughs> <All right. laughs> So now we're going to look at a second example 
Um, we're going to compare much bigger objects and imagine dropping them overboard from a ship and allowing them to sink to the bottom of the ocean. Because you've got the same forces, you've got gravity pulling them down to the depth of the ocean and you've got the drag force pushing up. So it's in a slightly different fluid, so some of our parameters will change, but it means we can sort of pretend to do this with larger objects. So we're going to consider the Eiffel Tower versus the Empire State Building versus a wrecking ball. Orientations and where we're dropping them. So if we have the Eiffel Tower, this is where you're measuring the drag. The Eiffel Tower is kind of falling down like this. Turn it on its side and let it drop like that. And that's because you've got all the drag coefficients. Exactly. That's because to be able to do these calculations, you need this drag coefficient. And for the Eiffel Tower and the Empire State Building, we actually have estimates of the values based on wind blowing into them. So that's what we need for that particular sidewards angle. All right. Oh, so what's going to win? Yeah. So this time you've got like the, the very big, heavy box like Empire State, like lots of concrete and metal. You've got the Eiffel Tower, which is a little bit smaller, but obviously still quite tall, still quite heavy. Are we taking its sort of holiness into account, all the mesh of it? Yeah. yeah, exactly. I was about to say, that's the key with the Eiffel Tower. It's, mm. The Empire State is just like glass and concrete and, and metal. The Eiffel Tower's got lots of holes. Mm. And then you've got, just, just to throw it into the mix, you've got just a big, like, concrete wrecking ball. I reckon the wrecking ball first. All right, so, so judge, is that based on the bowling ball having one last time? You think there's something about the sphere? It's just the intu my intuition yeah. is it will just plunge quickly. Yeah, yeah. And then I think... Although the one thing you're not taking into account, when things sink, I imagine them like doing that, but these aren't going to do that, are they? They're just going to push straight down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're all heavy enough that there's not, yeah, they're going to just drop. They are going to just drop. In that case, the Empire State Building. All right, so you think Wrecking Ball first. Wrecking Ball, Empire State Building. The Empire State Building might beat the Wrecking Ball, actually. And I reckon the Eiffel Tower last. For some reason. Okay. So it's the same idea. We need to just know what is our terminal velocity, and whichever ones have the highest value, that is going to win our race. Mm. So now we're moving in water, so in the ocean. Gravity, of course, doesn't change 9.81 meters per second squared. Now the density does change. So we're going to do this at the, uh, let's do it at the Marianas Trench, Mariana Trench, the, the deepest point in the ocean at 11,000 meters. So the average density of the Pacific Ocean is 1,036 kilograms meter cubed. So we've got uh, gravity doesn't change. The density is fixed for all of them, 1,036 kilograms. So obviously, because we've changed fluid, that's the key thing that's changed here compared to the first time. The density here is like a thousand times bigger than what we had in air. But everything else is, is still dependent on the object. So that's doing its work on the bottom half of the equation. Okay, yes, right, okay, exactly. okay. So these are going to be much slower because the number on the bottom is now much, much bigger. It makes sense. You would expect to fall faster through air than you would through water. If you jump into a pool, you don't sink as fast as if you jump out of a plane. So the objects then, so we've got the, the wrecking ball. It's a nice big sphere. We've got the Eiffel Tower with lots of holes in it. And then the Empire State Building. So for these three objects, we again need to know mass, drag coefficient, area. So a wrecking ball, average size wrecking ball, 2,250 kilograms. They're heavy. <laughs> the Eiffel Tower weighs about 9 million kilograms. Perhaps unsurprisingly, is pretty heavy. Uh, the Empire State, though, is going to be even heavier, is 365 million kg. So some very big objects. These two are much, much bigger. Drag coefficient, we've got still a sphere. The Eiffel Tower, so this is estimated to be between 1.8 and 2. The holiness and the fact that it has this steel frame actually creates a lot of drag because as the wind hits it, it kind of some bits go through and it just creates lots of turbulence and that's actually not. Or as the water goes through it. As the water <laughs> rather than the air, like yeah. So the Empire State is a bit better. So that's about 1.3 to 1.5. So definitely the most streamlined is indeed the wrecking ball as we might have thought, but the Empire State is more streamlined than the Eiffel Tower. Now the area for a wrecking ball, again, it's a sphere. So it's going to project into a circle. So if you plug in, these are about just under half a meter. Uh, in radius, about a meter across, I've got it as 0.67 meters squared is going to be your pi times the radius squared. The area of the Eiffel Tower, so you can think of it as a triangle, kind of do half base times height, but then there's loads of holes. I've got a value here of about 750 meters squared. And then the Empire State Building, much less holes. <laughs> it's just a big old block of glass and concrete. So I've got that 
estimated about 28,000 meters squared. So there's a really big difference. Now, plugging in the numbers. This is the this is the moment. This is interesting because I, I see the mass is going to go on the top of the equation. So it, the mass is going to get things moving, but the mass is a really big effect. Yeah. Mm, but how big an effect? But then it's also going to be slowed down by by this one being very big on the bottom. Which one did you? Should we go with which one you said? Was let's gonna, go. Let's go the Eiffel Tower first. The Eiffel Tower first. All right. So the Eiffel Tower, plugging in all of these numbers, uh, this terminal velocity comes out at about eleven meters per second. Okay. Doesn't mean much at this point. <laughs> it's just a, it's a number. What we care about is where the other two fit. So you've said that we, you thought this was going to be the slowest? Yes. Okay, so we thought that was going to be the slowest and the wrecking ball was going to win. Yes. So let's go with that one next, because if this isn't faster, then you've yeah. just... Okay. <laughs> so the wrecking ball then, you plug in the numbers for that and you get 12, about 12 meters a second. Wow, really close. Really, really close, yeah. And it's, it's, because, it's because of that mass, because there's such a big difference. The mass on the top there, it's, it's so much times bigger. It's 9 million compared to 2,000. So you need more mass to push through that water. Yeah, yeah. So even though the area is obviously so much smaller of this, of the wrecking ball, the Eiffel Towers isn't quite big enough to really slow it down too much. All right, go on then. Put me out of my misery. <laughs> it is gonna... No, you do. You're actually winning so far. Yeah. As long as this one is somewhere between 11 and 12. I'll see what might happen though. So, the Empire State is 13 meters per second. So wow. It's actually the fastest. Wow. It's the biggest, it's the heaviest, so yes, it makes sense it would go the fastest. But, we've seen that the Eiffel Tower is bigger and heavier than a wrecking ball and goes slower. So there really is a lot, it's, a, it's really to do with the drag coefficient in the area. For me, the interesting thing about drag equation, terminal velocity, this whole thing is just how important, how aerodynamic your object is and how streamlined and that actual frontal area, that projected area, making that as small as possible, making everything nice and pointy, is going to make you go so much faster compared to being really heavy. So when you hear all these much loved and hackneyed stories about dropping ball bearings and bowling balls off the leaning tower of Pisa and they should hit at the same time you must be like go away <laughs> you're not even thinking about drag well that's the point yeah so because the air on the earth is sufficiently thick it has an effect so there's a really nice um experiment that NASA there's actually a NASA video of this on the moon of one of the astronauts Dave uh, Scott Oh, you, my you favorite, my right? favorite astronaut. Dropping, dropping the feather and the hammer. Falcon feather. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The video is awesome, is it? Well, in my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. Yeah. So he drops the, the hammer and the feather, and they hit the ground at the same time. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here, and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Obviously, that's because the air is so much thinner that drag well, doesn't... There's, there's nowhere. Well, <laughs> so, so drag just doesn't have that effect. Whereas on Earth, you do have... Drag does have an effect. So if you did that on Earth, it's not going to happen. Right? The hammer's obviously going to beat the feather because there's more drag on the feather. So density, because the density of the air on the moon is zero, means you've got, <laughs> you've got a zero on the bottom of your equation. Does that so mean it's, it's going to 10. It's, so the terminal velocity will just be really big. So you'll just keep accelerating. Yeah, if, if your density is really, really small or is in fact zero, this formula says my terminal velocity will keep increasing. Regardless of mass. Yeah, if it's zero completely regardless of mass, yeah. Hmm. Because cause what you're going to do, instead of flattening off, this would just continue to increase. This episode has been brought to you by Brilliant. In-depth, interactive courses like these ones, well, that's Brilliant's bread and butter. But I have to admit, I'm also a little bit partial to these daily challenges. Have a look at some of these. One to five. Stylish socks. They are kind of stylish. And a mystery of dice. To check these out in more detail, plus everything else on the site, go to brilliant.org slash number file. Have a look, it's elegantly designed, educational, and frankly, it's kind of fun too. There's the address again, brilliant.org slash number file. By the way, there's 20% off a premium subscription unlocking everything on the site if you use that slash number file. This is, this is the power of the Reynolds number, really. Does the Reynolds number itself have units, then? The Reynolds number does not have units. 
the Reynolds number is just a number and we can actually see that. So the Reynolds number itself is density times length times speed divided by viscosity. 